Hey kiddos, today we're going to talk about molecular representations. That sounds like something that's really complicated, but essentially what it really boils down to is just how do we draw the molecules? How do we represent the molecules that we need to draw? So there are some really bulky, time-consuming ways, and then there are some much shorter ways. And obviously, you know, the, the bulkier ways sometimes are better because they give you a more complete description of everything. But when you're working with hundreds upon hundreds of molecules on a daily basis, working a bunch of problems or whatever, um, you, you sort of tend to trim things down. There are shortcuts. There are shortcuts in every profession. Um, and so what we need are some ways that we can sort of take a shortcut and trim things down while at the same time accurately representing the entire molecule without losing any of it. So we're going to start with the molecular formula. This is the molecular formula for the molecule that we're going to be drawing today. The molecule that we're going to be drawing is... 2-butanol, and uh, in a month or so, you will have no problem being able to draw that structure out. You'll understand what that means. That means that I have four carbons. That means there's an OH group, which makes it an alcohol. Two means that it's on the second carbon. We'll roll through all that naming and drawing stuff um, here soon enough. The reason that I say specifically that this is 2-butanol, though, is because we can have different constitutional isomers for this molecular formula, meaning that we could draw it as 2-butanol or we could draw it as one butanol. Um, we could draw it as um, an ether. There are, di there are several different ways that we could draw that particular thing. So we want to make sure that we're being pretty clear um, about which specific way we're doing it, which is two butanol. So that's the molecular formula. That actually is one of the molecular representations. Now, as you can note, that one's not terribly useful because unless you're talking about really, really tiny molecules, you know, talking about two, three atoms each, then they can have isomers and they can be arranged differently. And so therefore we need a little bit more. So our sort of fallback and what you learned a long time ago in chemistry is to draw the Lewis structure. Okay, so we're gonna draw the Lewis structure for this molecule. Um, and remember that what the Lewis structure means is that you, you've taken all of the electrons and you've accounted for all the electrons and you're showing all of the electrons. Um, and you're making sure that things fit the octet rule and those sorts of things. So let me draw this Lewis structure um, and then we will talk about what the next type of representation is going to be. So I said we had four carbons. Okay, I said that I had an OH on the second carbon. Since it's a Lewis structure, I'm going to include my proper dots. And then we're going to go back in and fill in all of the missing hydrogens. Okay, so this would be the correct Lewis structure. I've accounted for all the electrons. All the electrons in the carbons and the hydrogens are all bound up in the bonds. And then we've got a couple of lone pairs there on the oxygen. So that's the complete Lewis structure for this 2-butanol atom. It's not the only way that I could have drawn it. I actually could have drawn the oxygen over here. It depends on which side you're counting the two from. Again, we'll get into a little bit more of that later. So that's two ways. So now we're going to talk about condensed ways because here's the deal. Even with a relatively small molecule, which this is, I know you're thinking, well, it's got like 15 atoms, it's not that small. That's a small molecule compared to the most of the ones that we're going to talk about this year. Um, so even with a relatively small molecule like this, um, we still, it, it takes us a while and it takes up a lot of space. And you can see that if you had to draw a lot of these in a day, or if you were drawing um, C10H22, if you were drawing decane or something, this stuff is going to really start to get really extended out. So how can we do that in a more condensed way? So that's what we're going to talk about in these next two structures. We're going to talk about partially condensed and condensed structures. Okay, so here we have our partially condensed structure. Now immediately comparing that to what you um, hopefully just copied down in your notes for the Lewis structure, you'll see that what we didn't show here are all of the individual bonds between the carbons and the hydrogens. One of the things that we'll learn as we move throughout organic chemistry um, is that unless there's something to tell us otherwise, we're going to assume that any carbon is sort of filled in with enough hydrogens to, to essentially cover its four bonds. It, remember, it's tetravalent. It can have four bonds. Um, there are cases where that's not the case. There could be a charge. It could be a carbocation. It could be an anion. But that would be noted in some other way in the molecule that we'll talk about in, in future videos. Otherwise, we're going to assume that they're filled in. And so if you go back to our Lewis structure, what we had in that case was we had 
three hydrogens bonded off. We had two hydrogens here, and then another three hydrogens bonded off on that carbon. So that's the partially condensed structure. You'll, you'll note that what is similar to the Lewis diagram, I mean, the structure obviously is the same. It's just that we've sort of shrunk things down a little bit. We've made it a little bit more condensed. You'll see that there are still lone pairs there. Um, in our next version, you're not going to see the lone pairs. We're going to condense this down even further. Um, and honestly, the, the totally condensed or the condensed version is what you're pretty likely to see a lot of times outside of the line bond diagram, sort of, which will be the last thing um, that we'll show. And so it'll take some interpretation, some visualization, and probably some drawing things out into partially condensed structures or into Lewis structures to be able to really grasp where everything is and how everything is going to react with each other. So let's switch to the condensed model and we'll see how different this looks. Okay, so this is our condensed model. You'll see, first, the first thing you should notice is that it's, it's not as wide, right, or not as tall, that it's all in one line. Now, obviously, that makes it pretty convenient for, say, typing into a line of text or something like that, whereas a partially condensed model or certainly a Lewis structure does not lend itself to that. Um, so this is something that you could type out in a report and, um, and easily put all that stuff there. Everything that we need is here. The idea is that unless there's a reason to see that they're obviously not, we're going to sort of assume that the carbons um, are attached to each other. And, and you got to sort of, again, be able to visualize and say, hey, these are tetravalent. They've got to have four bonds on these carbons unless there's a charge, a formal charge on it somewhere. Um, so I've got to, I, I know that as I'm setting everything up. So I'm going to real quick just sort of branch the, what is this condensed structure back out into the partially condensed structure, just so you can see where everything came from. Okay, so the first thing is, this was the end of the molecule, right? This methyl group here, and again, don't worry about the names of the groups, we'll get to that. So that was at the end, that was then attached to this carbon. This carbon, okay, had a hydrogen coming off of it, and also an oxygen that had a hydrogen attached to it. We would call that a hydroxyl group or an alcohol group. Okay, so that covers, so I've covered this and I've covered that, and then that's attached to a CH2. That CH2 is then attached to a CH3. And real quick, you want to run through and just say, okay, that's great and everything, but does that, am I covering everything? Do all of my carbons have four bonds? You should always check that anytime you're drawing structures um, in organic, is make sure your carbon has four bonds unless it has a reason not to, like it, there's a formal charge on it of some kind. Okay, so everything does. There's two bonds in the hydrogen. There's a bond there and a bond there. That's four. Just run through and check and make sure that everything follows that. This is the condensed structure. This is the partially condensed structure. Okay, <clears throat> Okay. so we still got our partially condensed structure here. We're going to talk real quick about what bond line structures are. Again, don't sweat it if it doesn't all become apparent here because we're going to have another whole video on bond line structures because probably 90% of what we're going to work on all year are going to be drawing things in bond line structures or pulling things out of bond line structures. They're exactly what they sound like in that everything is going to end up being a line. And there are a bunch of rules that we'll go over in the next video. But I'm going to real briefly show you um, how this molecule would look if it were in bond line structure. So the yellow that I'm about to draw with, that is the bond line structure. So don't get it confused with this down here. So here we go. One carbon, two carbon, three, four carbons. Then I'm going to draw my... OH group off of that. So that's it for bond line structure. You're like, I didn't get that. How did you get from here to there? So um, real quick, and again, all the rules and everything like that we'll cover in the next video, but I wanted you to be aware of this type of molecular representation, the bond line or the line structure. So every point is a carbon, okay? We assume, unless we know something else, unless there's some other symbology that we'll cover in the next video, that all of the carbons have the maximum number of hydrogens that they can hold. They're saturated, in other words. And then we also assume the same thing about the oxygen. We assume that it has all of its requisite electrons, even though we didn't draw all of the lone pairs there. We're going to assume that they're there. Now, sometimes we will have to draw them, okay? And sometimes we won't. We'll talk about that in the next video about line structures. And really, as we go, you'll get a lot more familiarity with how to draw it. One of the things that you might be asking in your head is like, why do you draw it in this weird zigzag? Well, because otherwise there's no points to sort of show you where the carbons are. So carbon, carbon, 
carbon, carbon, and that would give us what our line structure was. We're not going to draw the carbons on it. We would just draw the lines. That honestly is probably most of the time the way that those structures get drawn. Okay, we're going to stop there for this video. In the next video, we will pick up with these bond line structures or line structures, and we will talk a whole lot more about the rules behind them and how specifically you should get that stuff drawn. All right, thanks, kiddos.